And it's the bottom of the ninth, and Obama's bringing out the reclassify ISPs as public utilities play. But wait, there's AT&T on third base. They're throwing everything down, apparently, and saying, well, we're just going to put everything on hold and not upgrade anything until Obama makes up his mind. We've got some uh, limited edition items in the store right now, guys, as you can see right over uh, the other way, that way, right over there. Um, you know, some people wanted like a, a blue slate blue hoodie, and I didn't think there was that many people that wanted them, so we made those. Some people wanted a pullover hoodie, so we made those, and then some people wanted a long sleeve shirt, so we made some of those. And these are in very limited quantities. I think there's only like 20 hoodies, like 50 shirts like this. Um, but they're just for you guys out there who have specific needs. I'm going to try to be getting that uh, and, uh, you know, Rage, man, I'm going to try to get you a tall shirt. I don't know if we they make them or not, but we I keep talking to the guy. We'll get you some tall shirts, man. Yeah, we try to take care of everybody. So anyway, if there's something you guys want to see, like one or two of a kind of, you know, like just a few things in the store, I'll try to make it happen. No guarantees. Also, we do have some really high quality handmade in America uh, messenger bags coming, and we're only going to get 20 of those as well because they're freaking expensive. They're costing a lot of money. But, uh, you know, for, if you want the handmade high quality stuff, We'll have them for you. So, all right, that's that. Let's move on and um, talk about the cool things that have happened this week. We have landed on a comment. Uh, Wendell, do you have a comment about this? <laughs> I have a comment about the comment from like, the comment, like comment the, department. From the comment? <laughs> I can't even <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so we landed like on the comment, and it's the first time we've ever landed on the comment. And uh, it's like, well, how big is the comet? Well, the comet actually, so we apparently had to fire harpoons from the probe to the comet because the comet doesn't even have enough gravity to keep the, uh, the probe from flying away. So that was sort of challenging. And it was a little touch and go there at first because apparently it touched down and then sort of started to take off again. And then it had to touch down again. And the harpoons didn't fire. Then they had to fire the harpoons manually or something. It's like bouncing and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So it was pretty crazy, but it's it's landed. It's fine. It's ready to do its scientific instrumentation test. And they had a handy chart to explain how how big it was. There were two actually. There was one for French people, which was you know it's going to fit basically between the Eiffel Tower and uh, the Louvre. And uh, then they had a a diagram for nerds, and it was like, well, it's a, it's much bigger than a Starfleet space station. It's much larger than Deep Space Nine. It's about as much volume <laughs> as a Borg cube, and it's way bigger than a Galaxy class starship. And I was like, this is very handy. I know what these things are. <laughs> like, oh yes, now I only I only need to break out my book of uh, how big everything in the Star Trek universe is because that's what we have around here, and uh, you know, <laughs> well, then you can verify everything. Galaxy class starships are pretty big, and you know, Borg Cube is fairly insanely huge. But you know, in, in terms of size, the comets may be a little bigger than the Borg Cube, but I think the Borg Cube's got it beat in terms of volume. So, eh. you know, I, I think the thing that they're trying to figure out with all this is is um, there's a lot of major questions that, that could be answered from this. For one, we could possibly answer some questions about how uh, you know water first came to Earth could could have possibly been an icy comet. Um, we can answer questions about like, could life have possibly traveled to Earth as a microbe or a you know just a something on a comet? Who knows? So there'll be a lot of interesting um, questions that we can ask. Who knows if they'll be really answered or not? But you know we can ask them. <laughs> and and this is a uh, kind of a big thing. I'm not sure if it's is this bigger than landing on the moon? Kind of because this kind of goes all over the you know the the solar system. Really, I don't know. Interesting. So Bitcoin has been slowly going back up, uh, as has Litecoin. And uh, this is some very exciting news here. Uh, Richard Branson, very, very, very uh, influential dude in the world. He, virgin, just everything. This guy uh, is a very cool billionaire. Um, he has decided to invest in Bitcoin, and he has some very interesting um, quotes here. Here's one of them I'll read. It feels strange to think of a world without cash, no more coins or notes for us to find. Uh, down on the back of the sofa. Uh, through making investments in the likes of Square and blockchain, uh, I hope to be a part of what could be the democratization that helps to put more power and control back into the hands of everyday citizens. You know, he's a billionaire, so he, I mean, he must be evil. So he must see some way that he's controlling the universe by this. And there's no way he could really want power to be back into the hands of the citizens, right? Am I right? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's what, he's, what he's saying sounds amazing. And uh, the whole idea of Decentralizing the power sounds pretty amazing as well. Uh, a lot of people are still skeptical about Bitcoin. 
having someone like Branson uh, investing in it is um, oh, what, what, what's the right word for this? It uh, it's just really good for Bitcoin, basically. I don't know. I think it's cool. Well, the the more people that use Bitcoin, the more legitimate it is. Theoretically, the more stable it is, or at least the uh, the floor on the value uh, gets a little higher. I still think that we're going to see some really crazy Bitcoin price swings. But the fact that Bitcoin didn't drop below, you know, $100, $150, $200 uh, during this, this last period, I think says a lot for the future of Bitcoin. Yeah, and I mean, it's on its way back up. And I feel like stuff like this is going to give it a good kick in the right direction. So um, I'm saying hold. I'm holding my Bitcoins. If you guys have Bitcoins out there, let me know what you guys are doing with them. I'm always curious. All right, let's move on and talk about Microsoft. .NET is now open source, and it's going to be available on iOS, Android, and Linux. I, what I'm seeing right here, I'm seeing Microsoft going, you know what? Uh, nobody cares about Windows anymore. What are we going to do? We don't own the universe anymore. Where's Bill? Bill Gates is off in some other country giving people vaccines. What are we supposed to do? Uh, I don't know. We've got our own our own framework, our own programming language, .NET. We've got our own thing, whatever it is that some people love, some people hate. But well, maybe we could just let them use it for everything. So that's what they're doing. And from now on, the, the, the Microsoft Visual Studio uh, will work. Uh, to for, as far as exporting goes for Android, iOS, and uh, Linux. So I, I feel like this is a decision that they had to make, even though they didn't want to make it. Am I right? What do you think? I think you're totally right. Now, here is something most of you at home may not know, that Google, when they were doing the whole Android thing, and, you know, Android, it wasn't really Google. It came from somebody else, but we won't talk about that just yet. <laughs> Google was looking at... Uh, Java and C sharp as the language for the platform. And so on the one hand, it was like, well, Java is not really, you know, the Android 1.0 generation phones, not a lot of RAM, not a lot of CPU horsepower. Java is not really the best choice, but you know, they were looking at how Java was with the, uh, uh, the company that Microsoft bought, um, that had the sidekick phones, you know, that was Java based. That was really solid. And the, 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 the Java on that worked really, really well. That was an astonishing piece of equipment. Microsoft uh, promptly bought it and killed it. Uh, so, yeah. um, And so Google was looking at C Sharp because of Mono and some of the other stuff in .NET. Because C Sharp's not a terrible language. It's basically a complete ripoff of Java. Uh, I mean, that's what it was designed to be. And it's actually pretty good uh, in terms of language architecture and features and syntax and those kind of things. And so Google was almost like, well, we could write our own... C sharp compiler and stuff and this whole Android platform and it'll be a thing, but they went with Java. And from what I understand, it was basically a 50, 50 split. If there are any Google insiders that happen to be watching us, no, they're not. We're retarded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, I would, I would like to know, but I, I had sort of know a guy that knows a guy that says it was pretty much a 50, 50 split on the inside. And I was like, wow, really C sharp really versus Java. So apparently that's a thing. So you heard I, mean, it I, I figured, you know, way back when I figured Google would have gone like all Python, you know, Python, because it's fun to say <laughs> Python. Look at these Pythons, and then they could have had like you know their 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 mascot could have been like some redneck with with big muscly arms, Python. Well, I don't know. It, I don't know it's, about it's, Python, but they love Python. It, it really is interesting when you look at that that statement in the context of. Uh, Apple and Apple doing the Swift language to make uh, app programming even more accessible to more people. So, you know, Objective-C is like, oh, Objective-C is amazing. No, Objective-C is not amazing. Objective-C was amazing in 1989. It's much less amazing today. It's just Swift everywhere. Is, yeah, well, I mean, it's, Apple's done its thing. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's like a bit like the Apple Store still running on web objects, which is completely insane. But... Uh, <laughs> But uh, oh, I can't be drinking you know. while you're saying stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> modern, there's a there's a ton of modern languages that are not necessarily inefficient that will allow you to be a rapid developer. And with the cost overhead of developing apps for mobile, it's like I'm going to quit my job and be a mobile app developer. No, that's not going to end well. I mean, the 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 amount of hours spent on writing mobile apps and the value from mobile apps in the app store are wildly disproportionate. It's it's the new California gold rush almost. So uh, that has not materialized. And so we just need to be able to develop apps and custom things for mobile really quickly with way less overhead. And the tools aren't there yet. It's not quite as drag and drop as, as, as you know, Visual Basic. But it's getting there, especially with Android Studio. But historically, that's not been the case. 
I wonder what you guys think um, about Microsoft opening up .NET. Do you think there's any other reason they could have been doing this other than self-preservation? Um, and and what do you, where do you see them going with this? Do you see them trying to get their stuff out there into the other markets? It would be interesting. You know, Microsoft, Microsoft Store type things in the Android Store? I don't know. I, I, that's wild speculation. All right, have, have you seen the time, Wendell? Uh-oh, already it's rant 30. Yeah, it's Rant 30. This is going to be a quick one, and then we're going to have some more Rant 30s later. I just feel like ranting today. I'm kind of angry about what's going on in Germany right now with the, you know, BND. That's the German spy agency. And you know what? I thought that Germany was going to be uh, the cool place. I was looking at Germany and thinking, like, man, those mountains are beautiful. I should go hang out over there. And now I'm pissed off at you guys. And Angela Merkel, I know you're watching. I know you always watch. I've heard from some other German person told me once through email um <laughs> anyway what's going on right now is they're <clears throat> they're spending a lot of money and they're trying to undermine ssl security which is exactly the opposite of what they should be doing especially since you guys are in the driver's seat of europe you guys should be setting the example not doing stuff like this and you've you've scolded the usa for doing things like this and you've, you've scolded the usa for making it um so that u.s tech companies are uh, you know in less demand and now here you're doing something that's going to make your technology companies in less demand. Instead of helping SSL and helping fix SSL uh, vulnerabilities, you're trying to exploit them. And you're trying to buy exploits from other companies and that sort of thing. How in the hell is this going to benefit you guys? I mean, I know you guys will be able to ooh, stockpile and data, you know, stockpile and put everything in a database. Are you guys developing the same sort of uh, you know, mental handicap that, that you know the, the NSA has here in this country, where they, where they have like a, a hoarding complex? Is that what you guys are doing, Angela Merkel? Uh, is is your uh, you know spy agency BD, BND? Are they developing a little hoarding complex? Because you might want to nip that in the bud before it gets out of hand. Because the next thing you got to look forward to is the freaking uh, you know in, in, intelligence. Uh, what, what do they what do they call that? The um, not the the surveillance industrial complex, the intelligence. I don't remember what it is, but man, you you got a, a lot of bad things to look forward to if you let this get out of hand. So you should be fixing <laughs> SSL vulnerabilities, not trying to exploit them. That's what the bad guys do. All right. So are you the bad guys or what? Hmm. It's the new hmm? era of McCarthy, and they're afraid of anything that's digital. And it's like, no, we must hoard all of the digital things. We must know. It's messed up. This is so messed up. All right. That's uh, that's the, the light version. It's like rant 15, I guess. All right, moving right along here. Let's uh, take a look at what Amazon is doing. They're trying to hire uh, drone pilots for their, their drone delivery service. And they're going to be opening up in several cities if they can get approval. You know, they've still got to get approval from the FAA, whatever it is. <laughs> Just botch that up. Oh, well. I still so, don't think yeah, this but, is practical unless it's like a business to business type delivery thing. I mean, if it's like the people that use bike courier services in New York City that and if you have that and you can land on, like from rooftop to rooftop, maybe it would be practical. But for most normal people, uh, this is just not practical. Well, I mean, I think this is only going to be open in certain markets like you just said, New York City, uh, you know, bigger cities, Los Angeles, maybe that's kind of a big market. I would probably not think it would work there. Montreal, Toronto, that kind of stuff. Can you imagine if um, with a drone, you wouldn't even have to go downstairs. Let's say you're on a fourth floor walk up. All you have to do is just order your, uh, let's say let's say you can go on Amazon Prime and get lasagna because you want the drone delivery service. Bring it right to your window. And uh, yeah, as long as the cat doesn't attack the drone, you're all good. There'd be a healthy, uh, you know, <laughs> healthy fee for cat attacks. That's one thing they got to watch out for. I don't think they've thought this through. You know, very, very high danger of cat attacks. I don't. The cat. It, there's going to be YouTube videos of like kamikaze cats. They're like, <laughs> I want the drone so bad. I'm going to jump directly into the propellers, and that's not going to end well on a fourth story walk up. Well, that's okay. We could just make uh, cat quadricopters off off of all the uh, deceased uh, cats. They died <laughs> going after the quadricopter, and now they will be a quadricopter or a octocopter <laughs> or a whatever. They should have cats delivering. So never mind. I don't, I don't know how we got off on this, but yeah. If a cat flies up near the window, that's going to really piss off all the cats. And they'll do that thing hey, where wait. they sit there and go, and that's for like 10 hours, and then they maybe slap each other in the head, then run like crazy. Isn't there some uh, kind of a bloodhound that delivers booze in the Alps? Why, why doesn't Amazon just train a you know, bloodhound to deliver small packages? It seems like that would work better. Hmm. Entrepreneurial idea. 
If they can do it in the Alps, why can't they do it in the sticks? And everybody needs booze at two in the morning, but it's very dangerous to drive, especially in places like Montana where that's a big issue. <laughs> because the bars are so far apart. You have a couple drinks here, then you drive to the next bar, and you wreck and die on the way. If you could have a bloodhound bring you booze, hmm, Linda, we should work on this. We won't have to do this crappy job anymore. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I saw that on Looney Tunes. Oh. Hmm. Damn, they beat us to it. All right, we'll next on the next year. Oh, Dark Hotel, this malware that's um, targeting certain high, uh, I don't know what, high stakes business people. I don't know, like CEOs and stuff. So apparently, there's Dark Hotel. It's a um, sort of a it's like a man in the middle attack or something. Not really. It's just basically the way this works is, uh, let's say you're a uh, an executive. You go to a in a hotel and you're always traveling and you're always online of course and when you get there you check in you connect to a wi-fi hotspot and then you know it comes up and asks you to sign in and all this crap but you're um while you're doing this there's something working in the background and then all of a sudden it's like hey man there's a software update whatever kind of software update just hey, there's a software update. just click up yes to update and you click yes to update and what's happening is you're getting um some malware installed on your machine so uh because Persky's tried to turn this into like an advertising scheme, saying like, oh, we're, we're the company who can detect this stuff. So I'm sure they're selling a lot of uh, Persky keys to people who are afraid of being tracked when they go to hotels. But what I kind of want to talk about is the, the overall idea here that when you're on someone else's Wi-Fi network, uh, namely a hotel, because hotels, you know, you come and go and you do business. It's not the same as when you, well, I guess, the coffee shop. I mean, you're going to steal some hipster's book or something or a screenplay. But, you know hotels there's a lot of sensitive information traveling over those uh wi-fi signals so uh, i mean like where, where am i going with this what, what 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 are the potentials here this is not really uh anything i mean this is like using an open wi-fi hotspot in a coffee shop that's not inherently not a dangerous thing to do you just have to be really careful and keep that in mind on public wi-fi you really should be using you know a vpn service or encryption, or, or not using a Windows machine. This is a good good opportunity to use a Chromebook or Linux on a laptop. You know, not Windows. Yeah. Or Mac OS for that matter. I don't know. Just uh, the I guess the moral of the story is here is when you're traveling and that sort of thing, ignore updates. Be careful of what you're signing into. Read the fine print, and uh, I don't know. Use snail mail instead of email. I don't, I don't know where I'm going with that. All right, uh, next up, let's take a look at PlayStation View. It's a, um, a new TV service delivered over the PS3 and the PS4. And here's the crazy part. You do not need a regular uh, you know, TV subscription. It's actually you know, channels straight over the Internet. Um, the interesting thing to me is that you know, it's, they're, they're keeping it exclusive to their platform. And the other thing is they, they don't have ESPN, Disney Channel, all that stuff. It's basically um a lot of the big networks out there a lot of the huge networks everybody wants espn but espn plays hardball and they do you know like you were saying a couple of weeks ago if you get espn they're like you got to get the ocho and you got to get my brother's <laughs> channel called um horse mating rituals it's channel 473 <clears throat> normally but you have to have that and it's going to cost you just as much as espn too sorry i did you got to have it <clears throat> rumor has it that a that there is a guerrilla marketing agency that may or may not be uh, trawling uh, forums on the internet right now, asking if people would pay, you know, the five to ten dollars a month for ESPN direct subscription. Now, this is not affiliated with ESPN; you can't trace it back. But dollars to donuts—that's an ad agency doing research for ESPN to find out about the direct subscription module. I'll bet you anything. Ten bucks a month is—I don't know. That's pretty high but if you're really into sports i can see a lot of people paying for that and just ignoring the rest of the television i mean there's i feel like there's a lot of people who just have tv because they want espn or or cbs sports or something like that sports people are a different breed and i, I guarantee you um a lot of bars and pubs and that sort of thing would just subscribe to that and just completely throw away the rest of their um their their cable subscription so it could be uh, uh interesting i can't imagine paying more than like 20 or 30 dollars a month for like a tv package i mean that seems completely insane but if you want hbo and a few premium channels you're going to end up with a cable tv bill that's over a hundred dollars a month anyway i've always found it more economical to do the netflix thing or just save the money and then buy the dvd box sets whenever they come out i mean yeah you don't get to watch tv shows whenever they first come out but i mean 
but you're saving, you know, fifty, a hundred dollars a month. You can buy a lot of box sets of television. This is why I read books. <laughs> I mean, I try to watch. <laughs> there's a couple of TV shows I do like, but by and large, this is why I read books, and and you can too. Uh, that just sounded motivational, so I did it. Um, all right, let's take a look at this Gizmodo article. How much money big cable gave the politicians who oversee the internet? And it looks like they're they are lining the pockets of Democrats and Republicans on both. I mean, they're lining both sides in both the House and the Senate. So it's a ton of money. And what's interesting here is this, this money right here. Uh, everything you're seeing. This is mostly direct contributions, and th all the super PACs and that sort of thing are not included in this sum. So the real sum is probably quite a bit higher than this. So it's man, they are just. Can you imagine if the if the the, um, the American people could afford to to pay this much to each individual on top of their regular salary, just for a specific agenda having to do with ISPs and 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 cable TV. You know, it's like, hey, we want to, to, to get together and donate this much money. We probably could if we really wanted to. We could probably get together and donate more. Than this, <laughs> but, but then there's every other issue. Like, you know, just, you name any issue and then, then the you know, they're getting a ton of money. Hmm. That was what the uh, super PAC or one of the things the super PAC was supposed to be on the political side, putting a, you know, sort of interest together. But the super PAC really didn't do well or the wolf pack or whatever it was. I think they had eight candidates they backed, and the two that were the only two that won were the two that were expected to win anyway. So that really didn't work out, and that's kind of terrifying. All right, let's quickly check out our sponsor. This time we're going to talk about Squarespace. Now, we use them for our store because it's all about the content. It puts the content forward, and that's what really matters here, the content. We're trying to create our identity on the Internet, and they've made it very easy for us. We want to go ahead and add a color, add a size. It's, you know, just add different options. It's just super easy. Integrates with ShipStation in the back end. And we're now on Squarespace 7, and the same philosophy is applied here. They want the tools to kind of get out of the way so that you can really create the site that you want. They've streamlined everything and made it just very easy to create sites on the fly. And above and beyond that, they've improved their mobile app so that you can just uh, use Android or iOS. And there you go. Go ahead, edit, create, check your analytics add images, you know, blog, whatever. You can pretty much create your entire site um, from your mobile device if you wanted to. If you're a developer, you're going to have Git access, so you can get in there and mess with everything. It's not just a website full of flashy templates that, you know, lock you into a certain thing. You can get in there and do everything if you want to, but if you want to go fast and just get things done, you can do that as well. I mean, you guys out there need some professional images? Well, now a couple of clicks will get you a Getty image. Cover Pages is also new. And uh, the idea here is sometimes you only need one page. So there it is, there's your one page ID. Very simple and clean. There's now integration with Google Apps for email, docs, spreadsheets, you know, everything. So check that out. I mentioned that they were listening to the audience for feedback and template ideas. They've also, they've also partnered with some of the quote unquote world's most inspiring people. And check this out. This is uh, Alex Hanold, he's uh, one of the best free solo climbers in the world. He needs a nice, clean and simple website. But uh, here he is free soloing up the side um, of the granite at uh, Yosemite. Very, very cool to watch. I mean, even the behind the scenes is kind of unbelievable on this. So I think it's cool that they're doing stuff like this. But you guys can go down and get the, the template that they, uh, you know, designed with him in mind. And then customize it to your heart's content. Someone else that they partner with is uh, St. Luca. He does uh, pop. I'm not familiar with his music. But uh, you guys could check out that template as well. So just a lot of new templates and a lot of new things that you guys can do uh, with Squarespace. Keeps growing, keeps getting better, keeps getting more robust, and yet at the same time, uh, it's not getting clunky and it's not getting in the way. It's all about staying out of the way so your content is forward. It's all about staying away so that the user experience on the back end is streamlined. So that's Squarespace. Now back to the regularly scheduled tech. All right, somebody obviously didn't pay the bills when it comes to the White House because President Obama came out and said he is for an open internet. He is uh, also for reclassification under Title II as a utility. So he would reclassify the internet as a utility so that it is free and uh, just not going to be messed with by all these ridiculous ISPs and cable companies out there. So yeah, I, I guarantee you someone's running around these cable companies right, go, right now going, who the hell forgot to pay the Obama bill? Who didn't give him money? What the hell's going on? <laughs> It's uh, well, quite ridiculous. I don't know. I don't know what to make of Obama anymore because candidate Obama was like, "Oh, we keep we got to stop jailing these whistleblowers, and we need to rein in these companies." And 
we we can't have this federal surveillance state. And then President Obama was like, I approve of all of these things. So I, <laughs> I don't know what you to know, make of this. I, this is probably just silliness. I, you know something funny? I saw as soon as this came out, I saw a really a good tweet. I forgot who who, who, did, who did this, but uh, it said, uh, Obama, best, worst president ever. So I was like, yeah, <laughs> that's about how it is, it seems. He seems pretty groovy, but then he do, does these things and you're like, Oh God! Who? Why did you do this to me? Hmm. Well, here's hoping that this is not some sort of manufactured uh, conflict. And for those of you outside of the United States, we officially now have, you know, Obama is actually a lame duck president. The other team is now in control of everything, and so by definition, he's a lame duck president. Uh, speaking of not being in control of you know <clears throat> everything, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler he told the web giants like Google and Yahoo and that sort of thing that he is not going to cave into pressure from the White House. And I like this statement here. He says, quote, unquote, I am an independent agency. He didn't say we, being the FCC, is an independent agency. He said, I am an independent <laughs> agency. He's starting to um, he's starting to scare me a little bit. I'm waiting for like you know him to transform into some sort of demonic robot and start eating people and that sort of thing. And uh, if you watch John Oliver, you did discover that he is, in fact, a dingo. And the more that he, <laughs> the more that he says that he's not a dingo the more likely that it is that he is a dingo because he is vehemently denying that he's a dingo. If, you're, if, he, actually, really wasn't a, if he really wasn't a dingo, he would just let it go. But no, he's fighting it. I'm, I'm actually surprised at this answer. I mean, he, he's sort of openly being like, <laughs> no, it's, this is not even anything. I'm, I'm really surprised about that, and here's why. He could have just as easily been like, well, you know, Obama has some... I mean, this could have totally been him. I'm going to try to channel the the you know alta wheeler that's from a parallel universe but it's like you know oh yeah you know uh obama has some really good points here with the reclassification of you uh, as utilities you know i've talked about that i've thought about it and it's a really tough call because these isps are going to have some really stringent requirements that they've got to live with and so i can see where he's coming from and it's good to know that i've got the support of the administration it's not the call that i would make right now i'm, I'm of course not compelled to uh to do anything with that right now, but it's something that, that we can maybe come together on and have some, you know, bipartisan support and do some stuff. But instead, it was sort of cackling like, you know, like in Star Wars when Senator Palpatine lets his evil side through a little bit. It's like, oh, it's like that, is it? Oh, interesting. Good. <laughs> Let the hate flow through you. Yes. Mm. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Good. Well, you know, after, uh, you know, Obama came out and said a lot of these things, a few of the companies out there, like, I think, did AT&T say this? And maybe Verizon said a few things of this. They were saying that they were going to sue the government if they did anything to reclassify them. Um, yes. Verizon's kind of backed off on this recently. Their, no. Their, their counsel no. said a few things. But no, they haven't? You don't think they have? No, oh, go ahead. no. They're, they are they are hardcore. Uh, I mean, they are hardcore, you know, bring it on. He's like, we'll mess you up, bro. I mean, this it couldn't, it couldn't possibly get any more abrasive. Not only that, but AT&T, you know, AT&T announced a couple of weeks ago that they were researching rolling out broadband into all these cities. Well, they came out and said, well, this net neutrality, you know, if we have to be neutral, we don't know that we want to upgrade to broadband. So we're going to, we're going to pause this planning that we're doing now until we get, you know, clear direction from the administration. And it's like, okay, well, first of all, you guys weren't actually in the middle of an upgrade. It's not as if you're, you're calling Randy down at the dispatch center and being like, hey, <laughs> Don't plug it in. <laughs> yeah, don't plug it in. You know, don't say it. This, <laughs> at, at, at this stage, all AT&T could be doing is just back-of-the-envelope planning. So, first of all. Second of all, uh, AT&T hasn't paid income tax in I can't tell you how long. And you know why? Federal subsidies. Subsidies for service, uh, tax credits. All this other stuff. It's like, why don't we as the taxpayers uh, put a pause on those uh, federal subsidies while they uh, put a pause on rolling out their infrastructure upgrades? Because the whole reason they've got those tax credits is to do the infrastructure upgrades. They haven't done them anyway. But if you're going to be like, oh, let's put a pause on that. All right, fine. You want to play that game? We'll play that game. Bring it on. We could use some tax credits around here. Small businesses can use some tax credits. The taxes right now are about to put us out of business. It's it's ridiculous when you get companies like this who uh, you know abuse the public. They're like, oh yeah yeah, you don't guys don't have to pay any taxes. You're doing uh, you you're doing the Lord's work. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. In office. Woo. <laughs> Yay! We like all this money. It's it's delicious. Uh, all right. So, uh, 
I can't just such gall to come out. It's like we're going to pause our infrastructure upgrades because we can't possibly use our infrastructure upgrades if we have to treat the traffic that's carried over our infrastructure in, in a neutral, non sociopathic way. It's like, <laughs> wow. You know what? Speaking really. of speaking of, of treating the traffic in a sociopathic way, uh, let's talk a little bit about these. These are actual man in the middle attacks that have been going on uh, with AT and T and also one of their uh, subsidiary companies, Cricket. So they have been. I'm mean, going put the right thing on the screen. There we go. Uh, apparently, they've been abusing um, some. I guess it's not exactly a a bug. It's just a certain type of encryption. Whenever there's a problem, it defaults back to um, plain text. So what they've been doing is they've been abusing this and kind of removing the warnings that the normal user would see being like, oh, hey, by the way, it's not working. This is plain text. They've been actually abusing that, removing that, uh, and doing everything they it's can to make sure that... Go ahead. It's, it's, it's just on email. Um, right, just so on email. What, what, email email is an interesting thing. So email travels over port 25 in the internet, and... Uh, email to maintain backward compatibility is still a plain text handshake. And so when your computer wants to send email, it's going to connect on port 25, probably. Well, yeah, I mean, not necessarily, but it's going to connect on port 25 and it's going to send some plain text uh, commands to the server and the server is going to send back a plain text response with all the stuff that it supports. And if start, uh, if start TLS or start TTLS is in the response, then the client and server can say, oh, we, we agree on encryption. Let's do the key exchange thing. And then they'll have an encrypted connection after that. And then your message and all your private data is sent after that encrypted. Well, Cricket and some other people in that plain text response in real time rewrite so that it's just X's where it would say start uh, TTLS or start TLS or whatever. So that that secure handshake never actually happens. Now, this is a pretty brain dead thing to do, and it may not even be intentional. It's really it's making the rounds right now, and you see it pop up in a lot of articles. But this brain dead behavior is actually the default behavior on Cisco ASA devices. And so, like if you have, Cisco ASA is like more for small business. It's like a border router type device. It's like the equivalent of like your home Linksys, and it's about as powerful as a home Linksys. Uh, but of course, it's running insanely proprietary Cisco software, and woo Cisco, woo. Uh, but the the default behavior on that is to block the encryption so that it can be monitored for corporate purposes and also monitored for spam and that kind of thing. It's just that apparently this wireless company has left it on, and they're like, well, you know, I don't. Oops, that's well, maybe we shouldn't fix that. I don't know. So that means that email that is sent over their service is not encrypted, which I think is a problem, and I don't think they should be. It's like. Somebody opening up your mail and messing with it and then putting it back and being like, oh, yeah, no, that's fine. I can see that in a company. I mean, if you're in a company and you're using corporate resources, the company can inspect their stuff. But personal email and personal devices and devices you own that are not company devices, I don't think that should fly. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to also give a shout out to Golden Frog because they're um, one. Of, it looks like one of their guys was um, one of the first to realize what was going on. And then they wrote some letters to the FCC saying, hey, we can't allow this to continue. So uh, Golden Frog, those are, that's Viper, Viper VPN for anybody out there who's a member. We do have an affiliate link on our website, and we have been enjoying uh, Viper VPN. When I was in China, I used them exclusively because they had the best service over there. Um, and I've used them on and off on different machines here, them and private internet access. So just another you know, hats off to, um, to Golden Frog and Viper VPN for, for finding this stuff. All right, you ready to talk yeah. about hardware? Or you want to, you well, there's, else? there's one other thing. One so other in, the, in the same vein of these uh, mobile ISPs behaving in ways that we as citizens should not tolerate in any way, uh, Verizon and AT&T are also adding a permanent and globally unique um, ID to the header of stuff oh, on your fun, mobile yeah. phone. Yeah, so if, if, you have, if you tether off your phone, I do that a lot, um, any unencrypted connection on any website, you get the a permanent cookie added in the header it seems to be related to your your device's phone number and so if you change devices it seems to the id seems to persist and the id seems to persist even across ip address changes and um tower changes and things like that at, at one point i was roaming i thought i think i was roaming my phone was warning me that i was roaming and the id was still there on the uh hmm. on the uh the test page and it's like wow that's insanely bad I mean, one thing that you can do to fix that is you can run a VPN because if you're running a VPN, even if you're on a website, 
uh, that's not you know HTTPS or whatever, it, they they can't they can't mess with it. They can't mess with your VPN traffic. So uh, you know use private internet access. Uh, use Viper VPN. Um, I'm also going to mention one more thing. Someone on the website today got on there, posted a very lengthy uh, complaint about private internet access, saying that he wasn't able to be uh, anonymous while he was, you know, purchasing his service, and he didn't want to put in his name and his, you know, any information about him. Well, yeah, you, you have you have to do that when you're getting a VPN. And he was complaining that he couldn't use PayPal, and I'm I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking like, you trust a company like PayPal, who's owned by eBay, more than you trust a VPN service. So, I mean, that, well, that's fine. You, you can do that if you want. But you do have to provide some information to get a VPN. And they, most how, VPNs do keep some logs. I don't know how true that is, though, because I've had one of the four members tell me that they put cash in an envelope and mail it to private internet access, and that works just it, fine. It supposedly costs more to do that. But oh. I, I, don't, I haven't, like, tried <laughs> it that way. Uh, I mainly use private internet access to improve my uh, speed on websites like, you know, Netflix and YouTube and that sort of thing. And I use it for... A few things like that, um, I don't use it to actually conceal, like fully conceal my identity because I mean, the, the ISP can still see like the IP address and that sort of thing. They still know some things about what's going on. They just, they know, it's, they pretty much know it's you. They just don't know what's going on. So they don't have the ability to prioritize your traffic. So I'm using it as more of a means to maintain my net neutrality. And if you're trying to get something to use it for uh, subversion tactics of ne or nefarious purposes, there's nothing I would recommend for you. Um, and while your privacy is paramount and, you know, it's, it's extremely important and you should be in charge of all of your own data. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a difficult area. There's, there, I mean, there, there's Tor out there. People, people infiltrate that. Um, there's, I, I don't know. There's just, there's, a, there's no perfectly secure way right now that I, that I know of to surf online, but there are things you can do to help protect yourself. So that, that's why I use a VPN. What? Well, and not, plus it keeps perfect, your sociopathic ISP out of your unencrypted traffic. That's the main reason I use it, you know. All right. Anyway, let's move on and talk about some hardware here. SanDisk has released an SSD that's uh, it's just called the UltraDim. It's an SSD that you plug into a RAM slot. And uh, this is going to be a, quite a bit of fun. I think we've seen some prototypes of these before. Uh, but this one is, is, is going to be in large capacities. Plug it right into your RAM slot. Uh, and then I, gu I guess what the main thing this is going to be used for is like virtualization, uh, super snappy servers and that sort of thing. And also high frequency trading. That's one of the, that's one of the <laughs> bullet points here. This is going to improve high frequency trading. I guess the bottleneck right now in a lot of different areas is the write speed of your memory device. And so with high speed or high frequency trading now, you'll be able to really, really make those uh, trades a little bit faster. We got to get into that. We got to write some high frequency trading algorithms. We got to do it. And, you know, so, but as soon as the common man gets it, they're going to make it illegal and they're going to figure something else out. <laughs> but we should do it anyway. I think it's got to take proprietary software because even though it uses oh, the dim yeah. slot, it, it doesn't work like RAM. You still are going to need gobs of RAM for high frequency trading. It's just that the uh, RAM interface is one of the fastest buses in the system. So the CPU can write from volatile RAM to non-volatile RAM, basically. Yeah. Non-volatile RAM is, is still slower than the volatile RAM, but it's still the fastest thing in the system. So, And, you know, servers tend to have a lot of RAM slots. I mean, the Dell server that we reviewed had a crap ton of, of RAM slots. And so if it works with that, that might be pretty cool. Yeah, you, I mean, it obviously is going to require <clears throat> some proprietary software, and it probably won't work on all platforms, but pretty cool nonetheless. Although, although they're advertised the speeds, it says sequential read up to 880 megabytes per second, sequential write up to <clears throat> 600 megabytes per second. I'm not really impressed by those numbers. Oh, it's that low? Did I miss that? Where, where is that? I missed that. Holy crap. That's, that's, on, um, the, that's on the specifications tab. Pres presumably that's just one dim, though, and you can throw 16 mm -hmm. of these in a server with 32 slots or something goofy like that. Yeah. But still, I've got stuff on the shelf back here that's faster than that. You know, I've got the OCZ yeah. Revo drive. That thing's a, it, it gets up to 2 gigabits per second. Or gigabytes per second, I should say. All right, moving on. What else is going on in the hardware world? Oh, we got more drone stuff to talk about. Uh, Hollywood has been going crazy with drone drones, and now there are, are several companies that have been approved to use drones. So just get ready, guys. A lot of the new movies coming out um, are going to be using drones. Uh, and, and the drones are getting bigger. 
and the drones are getting heavier. And the reason I want to talk about it this is because, you know, they get the cool toys first, but in a couple of years, some of this stuff is going to trickle down and then we're going to be able to, I mean, of course, I guess we can build the big drones now, but I mean, stuff like this is extremely um, expensive. You know, they've got the, the drones that can focus, the drones that can aim the camera, the drones that can pan and tilt and all that sort of thing, the drones that are super steady so you don't get a shaky shot. I mean, it's basically like a dolly with no rails that could just go anywhere at once. But uh, this technology will trickle down, and uh, there's already some things on the horizon, like the GJI that's coming out pretty soon. It's a little camera, smaller, but you get 4K at 24 frames a second, and it's it's going to be way more affordable than that. It, you know, it's, it's a small sensor, so it's not going to compete with the big guys. But you can also do 1080p at 60 frames per second and slow it down and make some nice slow-mo if you like. 12 megapixel stills. Just uh, a lot of cool drone stuff coming out for filmmakers and videographers and photographers. I'm quite looking forward to it. Here's a little demo sample. One thing that's nice, I mean, most of these things are going to be used outdoors. And when you're using something outdoors, uh, you're probably going to want, um, you know, everything to be in focus. And that's what you get with a small sensor. You, you, you get more in focus. Um, you don't get quite the nice, blurry, beautiful backgrounds. Um, and they usually need more light to give you a better image without a lot of noise. So this could look pretty good, and you could get away with using this for some indie stuff. Who knows? But yeah, there's... And I'm sure it's going to be expensive, but like I said, not as expensive as mounting a red to a massive, uh, you know, drone. <laughs> well, pretty cool. had, uh, there, there, there have been a couple of companies in California that, that can fly like one-third scale and one-fourth scale helicopters that have been mounted with these cameras. And that mm -hmm. works really well, except, you know, a one-third scale helicopter is still a pretty big piece of equipment. And you still have, you know, it's a large enough piece of equipment that, you know, if you're flying it around in a, on a bridge or flying it near public uh, stuff and it, something went wrong, it could take something out. And so there's permits and that sort of thing. But these drones are also small enough that they can be used in close quarters pretty safely. And I think that's probably a big big part of the filmmaking draw here is that we can get cameras in places we couldn't get cameras in with one-third scale helicopters. Yeah. yeah. This drone looks pretty good. I mean, I want to know the price on these things. I know it's not going to be oh, 2900 bucks. That's, that's really good. I want one of those. <laughs> I kind of want this. Hmm. I don't know what I'd use it for, but I really want it. It's another one of those things. I've been meaning to 3D print some more drone parts. I've got some of the uh, the aeronautical components. I just need to 3D print the frame for it and do some other things. Cannot wait. All right, let's talk about AMD Mantle and also AMD FreeSync. Got this off the forum. Pretty good news here. So it looks like um, toward the end of the year here, a AMD is going to be um, opening up Mantle and uh, public Mantle SDK is coming. That's going to be really cool. And so that, that means that NVIDIA, Intel, and you know whoever else, they're going to be free to use this. If NVIDIA wants to create cards that work with Mantle or even update their current drivers so that NVIDIA cards can use Mantle, giving them you know better low-level access to the hardware, they can do it. And I was really skeptical about Mantle at first. I mean, I loved the idea, but I didn't know how much we were going to see as far as the performance difference in games goes. Um, I recently just test, tested Thief and got like... I don't know, 18 extra FPS, which is a huge leap because it went from 30 to like 58 or something crazy like that. I forget the exact numbers, but you guys can watch the ITX uh, GPU showdown for the exact numbers. But the mantle made a huge difference uh, over DirectX in that game. And it's only going to get better as the de more developers start to use it. And it's only going to get better as more people start to program for it, you know, like NVIDIA and Intel. I know Intel is really looking forward to this, which is interesting. And I've heard from Secret Insider... Uh, people at AMD that Intel does intend to use Mantle on a lot of their things because let's think about it their their GPUs you know like uh, not their GPUs but they Intel is the the largest manufacturer of GPUs in the world right now because their integrated uh, GPUs are on laptops everywhere and you know the Haswell stuff it's got the GPU built in you know the previous generation has GPUs built in they're very low power and kind of crappy even compared to AMD's APU offerings but if they could use Mantle. And if more programs come out with Mantle support, you're going to see a jump in performance. So I'm really looking forward to that. I don't know. You, you have any uh, ideas? It's part of the standard. And NVIDIA has made noise that they're not going to support DisplayPort 1.2a. But it's part of the standard. And technically, it was part of the Visa standard when we were Talk talking about... Talk about FreeSync about, now, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, FreeSync. When we're talking about like VGA way back in the day. Now with DVI, uh, uh, sort of got... 
sort of got dropped. But in laptops and things that have EDP, embedded display port, it's been there for years. And that's why you can have FreeSync on a laptop, but not necessarily on a desktop, because the laptop will have the EDP or embedded display port connection between the graphics adapter and the LCD. And so for N NVIDIA to be to even act like they're not going to support that is crazy because it's actually part of the standard. So are they just going to ignore the standard? I mean, I guess it wouldn't be the first time, but that's <laughs> no, like but really... They really want to control everything. That's the, that, you know, I'm using NVIDIA right now. I'm using NVIDIA and Intel, um, and I use them because they give me the most performance, and that's why I'm using them. Uh, however, I don't own a G-Sync monitor. I don't really plan to buy a G-Sync monitor unless one falls into my lap. I really, really, really enjoyed... The experience I had when using the uh, the ROG Swift monitor, there's one right over here. Um, I really enjoyed that experience, but I want FreeSync. I want a, I want a standard that's open. I want a standard that's not proprietary. Um, and, and I also think it's really cool that when you take the exact same monitor and you have one with G-Sync and one with FreeSync, the AMD version is 100 bucks cheaper, the exact same hardware. So, I mean, they just need to get it with the times and support it. And NVIDIA, you're going to have to do this. Come on, you've, you've got to do this. Just loosen up a little bit. We're still going to buy your stuff if it's fast. And you guys are making some really awesome stuff. 980, 970, freaking amazing cards. Um, and you know, I just installed a Titan Z in my own system today, Wendell. <laughs> For no reason whatsoever. I, I installed a Titan Z in my own system. I just, It took me like 10 minutes. And I just rebooted my computer. And then I jumped into Skyrim for like 5 minutes to see how it was. And it's like... 20% faster than it was before us, which is a big deal for me because <laughs> my Skyrim was dying and choking and spitting and coughing. But yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's, I, I'm using your stuff, guys. Just, uh, get with the times and, uh, do it right. Anyway, specs leaked. You know, I'm going to click on this article right here just, just because I want to see this. I haven't seen this yet. Some specs have been leaked for the, uh, uh the AMD R9390X. Rumors, rumors, rumors. Oh my god. What's what's really big here is the, uh, the 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 amount of stream processors almost double, forty ninety six stream processors. That is ridiculous. So they need to up the RAM rumor. though. Yeah, it's all just rumors. Just rumors. I can't imagine that they're going to release a card with four gigabytes of RAM either. They're going to have to do better than that because we've already got eight gigabytes of RAM on, uh, you know, the Nvidia nine eighty and the, the the there's some versions of the uh, uh, the the two ninety with eight gigabytes. So. I want to see more RAM. Be good for productivity. Be good for Skyrim mods. I think of everything in terms of Skyrim mods. It's sad. And then I, you know, I put the Titan Z in there. And guess what games I'm going to be playing this week? I'll probably be playing some, uh, oh, Hotline Miami. And then I might play some of that Gunpoint, that really, really, really easy to play 2D um, puzzle game. I'll probably play a bunch of 2D games with my Titan Z. That's just uh, why I like being a PC gamer because I can do that. <laughs> I can install. I can install a Titan Z and play Hotline Miami if I want to. My choice. I can do whatever I want. All right. Uh, more hardware news. The Raspberry Pi, the original. Uh, it's now called the A+. It's a little smaller, but it's pretty much the original. And it is tiny. They've, they've shrunk it down. It is now about the size of a credit card. Actually, a little bit smaller than a credit card. But there you go. You got your little HDMI and everything on there. These things are great thin clients for um, TVs and that sort of thing. We should tell people to go watch that old video we made where you use this uh, <laughs> as your media center. Yes, that would probably be good. Because it's the same it's, hardware. It's they didn't they didn't change the CPU. They didn't add more RAM. It's just cheaper and has more general purpose I/O pins. I don't know what happened to one. I, I picked up one of these things, the Raspberry Pi, and you know that was back when there was like a six hundred year waiting list. I'm still waiting on it, I think. But I thought it came in, and I don't know what happened to it. Did Did you guys play with that at the office, or where did that go? I don't I have no idea where yeah, my I, Raspberry Pi I went. Think, I think you left was that it the one here. You used? I, I think we've got an extra one here. We've got like I don't know ten. Because <laughs> uh, it turns out that they make good things for stuff. So, like, you know, you can do an interactive TV or, like, a waiting room TV, that kind of thing. It works pretty well for that. Yeah, I didn't really have any use for it other than to, like, hey, I've got one of these things in case I ever want to do something with it. Because I don't have a TV or anything like that, and I didn't really have need of one at the, at the time. But now I was thinking maybe I'll get a projector and a screen that pops down and use one of these as a thin client to do something. I don't know. Wouldn't really watch movies on it. Maybe I'll have to build a PC and just play ROMs. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, enough of that thinking out loud while we're actually recording a show. Uh, let's go ahead and end oh, this thing. I, I just brought this up because it's kind of interesting. It's uh, a documentary here on Motherboard, 10 minute long, about robotic gardeners and the future of food in deep space. If you guys are curious, you could take a look at that. I thought it was interesting, and uh, I thought I would share it. just shows you uh, how they may grow food in space. So, yeah. 
Um, skyscraper of the sea. Let's take a look at this ship. We're into some science stuff now. So there's a French architect who designed this giant, partially submerged vessel that looks kind of like a skyscraper, kind of like a spaceship, kind of like a boat. I don't know what this is. Jacques, I can't can't probably pronounce his last name right. Ruggieri, Ruggieri, Jacques, Jacques Ruggieri, I don't even know. It's Jacques Ruggieri. It's pretty sure that's how you say it in Kentucky. Yeah. Um, anyway, this is a monstrous thing. And uh, I guess the idea is it would be really good for doing research, sailing around doing research. Some astronauts will be driving this thing because you know the 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 ocean we know like we know like less about the ocean than we do about the moon man <laughs> why it's do we have big, this crazy looking thing because global warming <laughs> this is a pretty cool thing and <clears throat> you know this was um he's been drawing this for a while and uh coming up with this for a while and what makes this actually a thing now is that there's there, there are some investors in the line so this is a pending project he's he's got uh lots of different investors involved here so it could be a thing I really want to see this thing. It's pretty wild looking. Looks like some of the buildings we saw in Shanghai, but floating. Video games! Good Old Games is having a really, really epic sale right now. It's their DRM free fall sale. I don't know what this game is. <laughs> I'm just clicking on games right now. Um, Hotline Miami is on sale for like a dollar and something right now. You guys should pick that up. Uh, some great deals on games like Stalker. Just There's a lot of really good DRM free games on here. Uh, I still, Good Old Games is still my platform of choice, even above Steam. And they're working on their own platform as well. So, yeah. Good old games. Have you picked up any games on here yet? Or I, I, I no, find I that I'm, I already have almost everything on here. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I was thinking about getting the... Uh, I saw the Icewind Dale like complete collection of uh, everything. And I was like, hmm, Icewind Dale. I could go for replaying that. Yeah, you know, I actually enjoyed Icewind Dale more than Baldur's Gate. Even though it was basically the same game in a different setting. You know? Uh, something about Icewind Dale. I think I just like cold environments. I think they. I think that the game was a lot more polished. I mean, it was basically the same game, just in a different environment. But I thought it was uh, just the little details were were there. They were like, well, since we don't have to write the game, well, let's work on making all the little details that much more interesting. So yeah, all right, that sounds good. Um, should we talk about this Ubisoft crap that's going on? Not really talk about it, but but point and laugh. Yeah, so Ubisoft, according to Forbes, is now the UE, the new EA, the UEA, the <laughs> U- UBEA. I don't know. They should just come. They should just join together and make one mega company that we can all just get together and hate. Um, I don't even really feel like talking about Ubisoft. I just don't buy their games anymore. We would all be able to just chill out and stop complaining if we could all just stop buying their games. So, all of you guys out there who are complaining, don't buy their games. It's that simple. I know they've got cool games. I want to play Assassin's Creed. Listen, they make an Assassin's Creed every three months. Just, just wait until they, just wait until they chill out. Send them a few messages by not buying their games. And the, the new Assassin's Creed is laden with bugs. So, <laughs> they're know, live blogging. So like they're live blogging to fix the bugs, and it's like, I don't <laughs> think software development works the way that you think it does. Because live blogging the fixes is not, not anything that anybody on your team would even appreciate and probably falls under developer abuse let, let me uh the other thing i think is hilarious about this whole thing is you know they've they locked the game at 30 frames per second and they've <laughs> it's just womp, womp. They're, they're, what's, what's even funnier now you know you can lock the game at 30 frames per second that's fine you if you guys really want to do that you can lock it at 30 frames per second just come out and say like listen the hardware limitations are such that we can't really do the game at any more than 30 fps or else it'll melt your system and that's not good and we wanted to have these lighting effects in there as well so we had to lock it at 30 fps but that's not what they're doing they're they're out here with this bullshit saying that it's a more cinematic experience guys let me ask you a question wendell um if it's thanksgiving and you guys are preparing food do you want you know one pound of mashed potatoes or do you want two pounds which is better i mean really <laughs> it's it's like 30 fps or 60 fps what what could possibly be better oh 30 fps is obviously the better choice i mean no that's not how it works like <laughs> if you can if you if you can buy a car uh, that's 30 horsepower or a car that's 300 horsepower which which is better oh the 30 it's much more of a, of a cinematic driving experience come on guys it's, it's, it's nonsense 
I just posted a picture in chat that was uh, it, it was the caption was actual bug in Assassin's Creed Unity. All right, I'm gonna get this. Oh yeah, that's that's uh, that's the one right there. Oh, let me. Uh, I gotta move it over here. There it is. I also yes. Pasted, pasted something that's, else from earlier. <laughs> that makes it so much more fun. I would love to play a game like this. This is some kind of nightmare world. <laughs> <laughs> is this on the console or on the PC? I don't know. I'm not playing this game. No idea. Yeah. Just don't buy their games, guys. Just stop buying Ubisoft games. They're. I don't know why everyone's complaining so much. Complain with your dollars. All right. <laughs> I guess that's pretty much it. <laughs> there was yeah. also wasn't there wasn't there some snafu over like Total Biscuits review and there was an embargo until seventeen hours after launch and crazy yeah. stuff like that. <clears throat> yeah, so they wanted that? to make sure that well they knew the game was going to suck and there was a lot of problems. I mean, well, maybe the game's good, but it's hiding under this layer of suck that, that and that, you know like the <laughs> intrusive DRM and all this other crap. So yeah, they they wanted to make sure that nobody reviewed the game. Until 16, 17 hours after it came out. Which is not the way the industry's always worked. But they wanted to make sure that they got that, that rush of people who just run to the store and blindly throw money at a product when they don't know anything about it. They wanted to make sure that they got every penny they could from that. And after that initial rush was over, people going at midnight and standing in line dressed in strange-looking hoodies and robes, you know. After they got that rush out of the way, then um, they're like, all right, then you guys can complain about the bugs and we'll be like oh we're fixing the bugs we're fixing the bugs don't worry don't worry don't worry so yeah <laughs> we're live blogging about it no that's not the way to develop software not i can't wait until far cry 4 comes out because you know what kind of shit show <laughs> that's going to be because what they're going to do i'm telling you right now what they're going to do they're, they're um they're already setting themselves up for this you know they're talking about how the i've heard the ps4 is going to be like the best experience out of all the different platforms Ooh, sony gave, sony gave us some money under the table that's what's really happening and you know they're showing these beautiful videos of, of how it's going to look and oh my god the mountains and the light effects and the elephants and the animations and all that stuff and then it's going to come out on pc and we're going to have the watchdogs thing all over where a lot of the graphical effects are nerfed uh, that that's a very big potential and we, we, we're gonna learn from our mistakes but money is, is so good and sony keeps giving its money to to and then we're gonna lock it at 30 fps because it's cinematic right the gamers are stupid right <laughs> <laughs> is that what you guys think of us apparently yeah yeah apparently all right that's pretty much the end of this episode we will see you guys in the comments on the website and be sure to send us some questions. Just go to techsyndicate.com. Yep, go there. Uh, techsyndicate.com slash forum slash inbox exe, all one word. And send some questions to us. We go and we answer those for our inbox videos. So, yeah, we'll be doing a lot more of those. And uh, that's it. So, yeah. See you guys later. You should thumbs up the video because I asked. He's asking. <laughs> I'm demanding. You better thumbs it up. Thumbs it up? Thumbs it up, everybody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we should have ended when we were ahead. <laughs> <laughs>